Amen. I'm going to do something in the message today that I've only done two or three times in almost 30 years. I'm going to continue from a message from last week. A series. What do you think? Hey, never done that before. Well, there is a nice guy, Dan, that, uh, you know, and a very spiritual brother, Dan, that uh, has been has been encouraging me. You know, Pastor, you know, sometimes we want to know more about a subject, and uh, you could do a little more on the subject. And so as I prayed about it this week, it's like I heard the Father saying, Son, do more on the subject. Yes, sir. So between uh, Dan and the Father, I'm going to do, What does Jesus do for a living? Part two. Now for those, isn't that a great question? What does Jesus do for a living? I know what you do for a living. You drive a truck with all kinds of merchandise all across the country. You go to Jersey and Chicago and and a lot of us know what we do for a living. What does Jesus do for a living? If you really think about it, what does he do all the live long day? Well, number one, I'm going to just uh, take 10 minutes to capsulize what we mentioned last week for those who weren't here. And if you have your notes, go ahead and uh, check them out. Maybe add to them. As a matter of fact, uh, Linda has started to move the logo on the back of the bulletin to the front of the bulletin so we have more room for notes because Dan was saying he was writing all around the heart of the hills and, you know, you know. Amen. First of all, Jesus, he is our high priest. Man, you think of the Old Testament high priest and how he would go into the Holy of Holies and offer blood once a year for to cover the sins of the people. Well, Jesus did that once for all, took his own blood, went into the heavenly holy of holies, and man, we are free. We've been forgiven. We've been delivered. And all we have to do is receive it, mix our faith with it, and walk in it every day. Amen? Another thing a priest does when we pray, the priest would take the things that the people would say, and offer it to God. And then they would turn around and offer the things from God back to the people. That's what Jesus does. He's my high priest. And I'm glad that sometimes when I sin, anybody here ever sin? Come on, every hand ought to be up. I'll cast a spirit of lion out of you. <clears throat> when we sin, the Bible says that if we, if we say we don't sin, we make God a liar. But when we sin, we have a high priest, an advocate. He's before the Father. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's Jesus, my high priest. What else does Jesus do for a living? He's a lawyer. And a good lawyer. Very similarly to what we were just talking about, he represents us before the Father. And he says, Father, I covered that with my blood. And he argues in our defense and asks and receives our forgiveness from the great judge of all the earth. What else did Jesus do for a living? You'd have to look back into last week's message to get the depth of this. Because not many of us know what a refiner is. I don't even know anybody who is a refiner. I don't know anybody who is in the business of taking metal and melting it down and superheating it. Let's say you've got gold. And you want that gold as pure as possible. That gold has to be heated. And there's two ways to get the heat and the fire going in your life strong enough to get rid of the, get rid of the mess. You either get it heated by high praise. Anybody like that method? You get involved in praise and worship. And sometimes that stuff burbles up in the middle of praise and worship. And you say, where'd that come from? Don't worry. Just say, Jesus, my refiner, please take that out of my life. And then go right back to praise and worship. That's all that is. The other way to get your life so hot that the junk comes out is through trouble. How many prefer praise and worship? <laughs> so I just as soon worship God to the point that it's hot. And you know, you could do it during the week too. And these things will come floating out. But he's a refiner. He's the one that takes and when it's really, really hot. And you can tell when the, when the dross has come to the top and he scoops it off and leaves the pure gold. And I like one thing that one of the preachers said. He said the refiner knows when it's pure when he sees his own reflection. I love the fact that when Jesus 
takes the dross out of our life, we become pure, you know, in his righteousness, that he can see his own reflection. How many want to look like Jesus? I mean, I do. I do. So he's a refiner. Jesus, well, that was three or four pages. I brought 13 pages with me today, but never fear. The first seven were last week. What else did Jesus do for a living? Do you remember what he did on earth before he started the ministry? Carpenter. Jesus is still a carpenter. And this is one of the things that really touched my life. And I've already posted this on heartofthehills.com under sermon notes. You can look this up. The, the notes that I have right here before me, you can see word for word there. But the thing that really spoke to me, it's in 1 Peter 5. Don't turn there. I'll, I'll read it to you. I've got some other verses for you to turn to. 1 Peter 5.10, it says, But the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you've suffered a while, has anybody ever suffered? Doug, you ever suffered? No, no, not every day. <laughs> I know, I know. Pressures of life can do that. But after you have suffered a while, it says, where'd it go? There you go. He'll make you perfect. He'll establish you. He'll strengthen you. And he'll settle you. And I just knew in my spirit before I studied this last week, that those Greek words, because you know the New Testament was written in Greek, you can find more information and more accurately what the scripture was trying to say by looking at the Greek. And the four Greek words, I just knew they would have some sort of reference to carpentry. And I was absolutely right. And these four Greek words about him being a carpenter, this is what he does for a living every day. Here's what he does. He makes you perfect, and the Greek word means to complete thoroughly or to repair a good carpenter can repair a broken wooden table a good carpenter knows how to put the clamps and the glue and make it better than new amen when our lives are busted man he knows how to glue it with the holy ghost and clamp it and make it even better than new it's such amazing the second word establish it means to turn resolutely in a certain direction i can just see the carpenter you know something's not quite right, you know, and he just, he says, well, this is just, the, the chairs turn the wrong way, and, I don't know, just turn it around and nail it and glue it, and it's perfect. It's exactly where it needs to be. Our lives might be going the wrong direction, but the carpenter knows how to turn it and establish it and fix it. Strengthen is the third one, to make strong and to confirm. And the fourth one, settle. I just love this one. Uh, Dan, you had a deck uh, Dan and Robin put on your house in the last year, right? Did they put a nice foundation for it? Or did it just, just sink into the ground every time you walk out? <clears throat> okay, so the old foundation was good. But a good carpenter, he doesn't just deal with wood. He also knows that if you're going to put a deck on the back of the yard, boy, you better dig that hole deep. And you better put in the proper gravel and, and cement and block or whatever you do and make a firm foundation. And that's what Jesus does in my heart and it was he does in your heart. After you've suffered a bit, he comes back and repairs and confirms and lays a solid foundation. Isn't that great? That's what my Jesus does for a living. The second to last thing from last week, what he does what else does Jesus do for a living? He's a potter, not Harry. All right? He's a potter. He throws the clay. How many have seen people throw a pot? And, you know, and they, they either have the electric or the one that, that kick, you know, and so forth, and a big, heavy, uh, what do they call that thing that spins? A who? Well, the wheel, yeah. I'm trying to think of it's another term for it, but that's right. Big old heavy thing that spins continues spinning. So once you get it going, it's really good. And then they make the pot. And then if they, you know, oh, that wasn't quite right. And you think it's beautiful, but he sees an imperfection. So he goes, squish, <laughs> it starts over again. Have you ever seen anybody do that? It's like, oh, that was lovely. Why didn't you squish that? But at the same time, the Bible says, we who are the pots have no right to say to the potter, why have you made me this way? 
Why did you make me black or white or blue eyes or male or female? Why did you have me born now? God makes no mistakes. If you really open yourself up to God, Mike, God has a work for you, see? He made you exactly the way he wants you. Exactly. So we can't complain and say, well, you know, why did you make me this way? No, no. We need to say, you've made me this way, okay. So show me how I can be used in the kingdom of God. What kind of a pot did you make me to be? What kind of a, uh, a porcelain bowl? What kind of a what have you. And then lastly on that, when we are broken, and it's, boy, you have to look at last week's. But when we're broken, the potter is so concerned for it. This is after it's been all made and fired and it's all solid and sometimes the pot is broken. The potter has the skill. And Jesus knows where every piece, every broken piece of your life is. And he puts them back together lovingly. And he uses the Holy Spirit, some special glue of the Holy Spirit, that it's sort of translucent. When he puts us back together again, we're not just this dark pot anymore. We're this pot, we're a cracked pot. <laughs> Anybody hear cracked pot? Cracked pot? And then when, then when he puts light in there, the light of the love of God, the light of the glory of God goes in that cracked pot. It's beautiful. And it gives light to all those around. You see? So he's the potter. <clears throat> and finally from last week, what else does Jesus do for a living? How many have heard of the mythical Greek titan named Atlas? And what does Atlas do? See this big picture of him carrying the globe. Well, you know what? What does Jesus do for a living? In Hebrews 1.3, it says, He, Jesus, upholds all things by the word of his power. His word. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. But his word is keeping the earth rotating around the sun and keeping the stars in their place and keeping meteorites from crushing us. You know what I'm saying? He is the master. He's upholding everything. He said to the waters, thus far and no more. He's the one upholding everything by the word of his power. So this is part two. What else does Jesus do for a living? He's a teacher. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus was already ascended and sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Well, let's look at some excellent verses in John. Somebody around here has been studying John. John 14, we'll start with verse 26. As you're turning there, let me just say this. Even though Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father and is interceding and praying for us as high priest, he's also very talented. And he works through another part of himself. He works through the Holy Spirit. And so therefore Jesus can till, still continue teaching us, but it's through the Holy Spirit. How many understand the concept? All right. John 14, 26 says this. But the counselor, what does your Bible say? Counselor, anybody else? Comfort or anybody else? The, the who? The Father? I was going to say. What trans <laughs> Advocate. Counselor, Holy Spirit, Helper, exactly. Uh, who is that? Uh, Marshall, Catherine Marshall wrote an excellent book called The Helper. That during the charismatic uh, Methodist days, Mom, we were talking about in the car, uh, those charismatic Methodist days, uh, Catherine Marshall's book, The Helper, helped a lot of Methodists come and understand that the Holy Spirit is alive today and giving his gifts and his fruit. Wonderful book called The Helper. But all those words come from one Greek word. Does anybody remember, because I've taught on this subject before, what, which one? Parakeet? Paraclete. How many knew that? But the helper, the paraclete. And the paraclete in the Amplified is translated as comforter, 
counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby. That's who he is. He does all those many things. I call that chachias. Comfort a counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby. It'll help you to remember what the Holy Spirit does in your life. It says here, but the paraclete, counselor, advocate, whatever your Bible says, the Holy Spirit, let's go on, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll do what? He'll teach you all things. And he'll remind you of everything I have said to you. Look up here for a second. That is so amazing. When I'm in a church service or I've done my own Bible study and I've learned something from the words of Jesus and I go along in my life and all of a sudden I need those things, the Holy Spirit brings them right back in the front of my mind and I'm able to teach someone else and I'm able to use those words. See, it's so important to use words because remember the devil came to Jesus and he said, if, if you're the son of God, make this stone into bread because he'd fasted for 40 days. How did Jesus defeat the devil? He spoke the word. And so if I've learned the word, the Holy Spirit will remind me of the word and then I can speak that word right out and say, get thee behind me, Satan. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the Holy Spirit will help you, remind you of things that Jesus has taught you. Let's keep on going. Verse 27, are you there? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. I do not give to you as the world gives, thank God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be what? Boy, I... I oof. I could get up here for an hour on a Sunday morning and say that over and over, and that would minister to some hearts. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Who's he talking to? All of us. And if your heart's troubled, that means who's letting it be? That be us. <laughs> Do not let your heart be troubled. It's one of the things Joyce talked about this weekend that Mike so eloquently brought out. The clothing of peace. You've got to put it on. If you're not walking in peace, people can tell. You know, it doesn't look good when you're walking as a Christian and not having peace. It doesn't look good to see a Christian agitated. Amen? Peace. My peace I give unto you. Thank you, Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And if you switch over to John 16 and verse 27. I want to finish this point that Jesus is still a teacher, but he's teaching us through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. What does Jesus do for a living? He's a teacher. John 16, 7, but I tell you the truth. It's good for you that I'm going away. Ah! Can you imagine those poor disciples? Man, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to them since sliced bread. I don't think they had sliced bread back then. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to them since the invention of the wheel. I mean, here they found a guy that can feed thousands of people. That can heal everybody. And preach the good news of the kingdom and people can be saved. How much better than to have Jesus walking with you? Okay, there is something better. How about Jesus walking in you? That's why he said, it's better for you folks. John 16, 7, I tell you the truth. It's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And see the Holy Spirit. It's just like Jesus. He is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it's the manifestation, different manifestation of God. God the Holy Spirit. So in that way, Jesus is the teacher. One more verse on teacher. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, if you would please. You're going to get this. This is just, you're going to get it. You're going to understand this. And it's going to help you. And it's going to bless your life. Matthew 4, 23. I noticed something. I'm reading from the King James. And it says this. And Jesus went about all Galilee, and notice this, teaching 
in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So as you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that. And all of a sudden you're reading in Mark and all of a sudden it says, and Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and healing. And it's so very interesting because it always comes in that order. Look it up in your own Gospels. So teaching is so very important. What is teaching? It tells us about God. It informs us about the things that he has done for us. Teaching. What is preaching? Preaching is saying, so what are you going to do about it? Amen? It took me years to figure out the difference between teaching and preaching. And now I've learned a little bit about that. And I can tell when I'm teaching. Right now I'm teaching. Sometimes I'm preaching. What are you going to do about it? I'll stand on toes for a while and I'll say, you know what? It's up to you to do the word. So I kick into preaching. And then healing follows the preaching. So very interesting. Just put that in your mind as you're reading the Gospels. He went about teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of diseases. So what does Jesus do for a living? He's a teacher. What else does he do for a living? It just said, he's a preacher. Teaching, preaching, healing. So many times... Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. And all of a sudden, man, he turned to preaching. <laughs> he, he would suddenly say, the axe is already laid to the root. So get it straight, people. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? He would say, start bringing forth righteous fruit, because God can raise up children of Abraham from these rocks. And he was preaching and telling them, come on, live this thing. Telling them what to do encouraging them. And then sometimes Jesus would preach and say, don't do what the Pharisees do. He's tell so preaching is more, what are you going to do about this? And telling you how to live this godly life. So what does Jesus do for a living? He's also a preacher. Amen? He's got a lot of jobs. What's the next thing he does for a living, according to the gospel I read you? He is a teaching the teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel, and healing. See, I almost put it down. As a matter of fact, I think I referred to Jesus last week as a doctor. Well, I was wrong. Because see, a doctor treats your symptoms, and doctors treat us until we are healed. Jesus heals. So there's a difference. So it's not so much that he's a doctor, he's a healer. Let's look at some verses. One of my favorite verses on healing, Matthew chapter 8. Why don't you go ahead and go there? If you're writing notes, you might want to write down 1 Peter 2.24 for healing verse. I'm not going to bring it today, but some of my favorite New Testament healing verses. And Matthew 8.17 is my other favorite healing verse. But let's go back to 8.14. Reading from the New International Version. Matthew 8, 14. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law, so you know Peter was married. How many knew that? Hmm, I wonder why, well, I'm not going to go there today. <laughs> if Peter was married, why can't the Pope be married? Because it's a man thing. People got to read the Bible and go back to the Bible and not go with man's doctrine. So he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. Jesus is a what? A healer. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait upon them. Verse 16. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word... And he healed how many? <laughs> I've been to, look up here for a moment, I've been to many a healing service, and some of you have. Some of you have it. It's really interesting. But, you know, there'll be healing lines, and I worked with Charles and Francis Hunter, and uh, they used to say, 
85% of the folks that come up get healed. And yet, I was the worship leader and the piano player, and I'd watch people hobble up and hobble back. You know, and I, I never could get that 85%. I never did see it, really. I'm just being honest with you. There were some amazing healings. I'm okay with their spiritual healing, but they were talking about physical healing. They flat out said. And yet, when Jesus was healing, when people came to Jesus, how many got healed? Oh. Oh, man, he's a healer. He's still a healer today. Through the Holy Spirit living in you, Jesus said, lay hands on the sick in my name and they shall recover. Who's doing the healing? It's Jesus. Jesus is still a healer. So when we lay hands on the sick in Jesus' name, the healer rises up through us, works through our hands, and with his healing power, drives out demons and cures every sickness and every disease. But we have to pray expecting. Amen? We have to pray in faith. It, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Jesus is still a healer. Let me read verses 16 and 17 one more time. I didn't read 17 yet. Because of some of my favorite verses on healing. When I'm looking for healing in my own body. When I'm meditating upon healing scriptures, many times I come to these verses. Matthew 8, 16, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with the words, and he healed all the sick. Verse 17, this was to fulfill which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, he himself took our infirmities, and he carried our diseases. Jesus what does he do for a living? He's a healer. What else does Jesus do for a living? Well, this is doing pretty well. I'm on page 9 already. <laughs> what else does Jesus do for a living? He's an author. He's an author. That you know, some of you probably thought of that. And so beside the obvious that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were involved in writing the Bible... Which, by the way, I read once again this week that the Bible is the best-selling book in all of human history. No surprise. It, written, inspired by God, inspiring men. Basically, Jesus is the author. He's the author. But besides that, look at Hebrews 12. This is a oh, wonderful verse that will encourage you when life gets you down. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3 in the New International Version. That's a great chapter, <clears throat> Hebrews 12. And Hebrews 11 is another great chapter. You should go back and read those many times. It'll encourage your faith. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, did you know that you're not alone? Did you know that you're being watched? <laughs> that sounds scary. I didn't mean that. But you're surrounded, literally, by a cloud of witnesses. We know we have angels with us. And he says, beyond that, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So let us throw off everything that hinders and throw off sin. I know some translations say throw off the sin. But other translations just simply say, just stop sinning. Just throw off sin. It's a great way to live. Especially if you know that you have to give an account. Especially if you know that you've got witnesses. You know, people say that character is what you do when no one's watching. And really, that's never true. God is always watching. The Holy Spirit is always watching. And there is a great cloud of witnesses. So that might help you not participate in the sin when you're tempted. Saying, wait a minute. I'm not alone. I'm going to give account for this. I'm being watched. ADT installed a little monitor in my bedroom. <laughs> you know? No, they didn't. But God knows. Therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and stop sinning. Throw off sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You know, look up here just for a moment. I love it when preachers tell the truth. 
I love it when preachers get up there and say, well, you know, living this Christian life, it's going to cost you everything. You know? I love it when preachers tell the truth and say, when you come to Jesus, welcome to the war. I love it when they tell you the truth. Because all of a sudden you're alive in God and you've got tools and spiritual warfare and suddenly you become more interesting to Satan and suddenly he begins to attack you more. Is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. It's worth it over and over and over and over and over again. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. One day in your courts is better than thousands elsewhere. To be in battle to live this life and to work out my salvation is so much better than sinning and just sliding through life. That's dull. Give me the battle. Doesn't that sound strange? But when you look at it, it's really the only way to live. We are called to be soldiers. And what does a soldier do? A soldier battles. Doug, you've got the tools, man. And he'll help us. And teach us how to win the battle every time. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Let's see. Where was I? Hebrews 12. <clears throat> Talking about Jesus being the author. And let's try to finish that. Here we go. Uh, let's look at verse... Oh, right. I just read the end of verse 1. Let us run with perseverance. That's where I was at perseverance. It takes perseverance to be victorious in the Christian life. Can I have an amen? But it's so worth it. Verse 2. Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author. See, it says it right there. But not only is the author of our faith, he's also the, what does it say next? The who? Perfecter in some translations. Other translations? The finisher. So not only did he start writing your book, folks, he will finish writing your book. Isn't that good news? Now, yes, you have to participate. Yes, you have to say yes to him. Yes, you have to do what he says. But stick with it. Keep working with Jesus. And not only did he start the book, he's not going to let the book fall off the table. He's not going to let it go in the trash. He's going to finish that book. And that book of your life will end with, well done, you good and faithful servant. And the victories will be all written in there. But you've got to keep walking with him. Amen? But such an encouraging thing. He's an author. Jesus, what does he do? What's his, what's his calling? What does he do for a living? He's an author. And he's writing in your life. And he's encouraging you. So long as you work with him, he will finish. Doesn't that make you feel good? Boy, it encourages me. So verse 2, let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That's heavy duty. He was on the cross suffering, but he could see in his mind's eye by faith the joy that was set before him, the joy of being back in heaven with the Father, the joy of having millions of, of Christians, millions of followers, following him, living for him, defeating the devil. What joy that must have been. And so for this joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you might not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus will finish the book. Amen? What else does Jesus do for a living? This is one of the big ones, if you really think about it. He's a shepherd. Turn once again to John, John chapter 10. He's a shepherd. How many knew that Jesus was a shepherd? He's the great shepherd. He's the shepherd of the sheep. Is anybody here a sheep? Ah, thank you very much, Patty. She's the only one that went, Bah. We are sheep. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Al and I sang that over and over in various uh, sacred songs in high school and over the choir in Europe when we traveled. 
Does the words would over and over come up that we are his people. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and so forth and so on. Help us to memorize the verses. Help us to memorize the word by singing them. It's a good thing. So join the choir. All right, here we go. John 10, by now you found it. Verse 1, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way, he's a thief and a robber. Verse 2, the man who enters in by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. Verse 3, the watchman opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And folks, this verse 4 is so very important. You ought to memorize John 10 4. 10 4. 10 4. Here's what it says, good buddy. It says, When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Anybody here a sheep of God? Then you know. His voice. I don't have time to teach on it, but you know. Sometimes it's a matter of studying the word and learning the word to the point that you, when, when, when you hear his voice, you'll recognize his voice because, hey, that sounds like something that was said in here. Because he's not going to go against his word. Amen? But you, you hear many voices. <laughs> Some of you more than others. <laughs> Ever pray a prayer and you say, Lord, shall I do this? You hear, yes, no, maybe, maybe tomorrow. Fifteen different voices. But the more that you've practiced your spirituality, the more that you hear God, the more you'll recognize which one was the yes, which one was the no, which one was the wait till tomorrow. See? Because it says in 10.4, John 10.4, my sheep know my voice. You know the voice of God. You know the voice of God. Practice listening. Compare it to the word. That's a whole other sermon, but it's just good stuff. So he's our shepherd. And we know his voice. Well, you, you can read, read the rest of that. But skip on down to verse 11. Well, let's start with verse 10 because that's such a powerful verse. Verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And that's not the shepherd at all. That's Satan. But I, the great shepherd, have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And then verse 11, he just says it flat out. I am the great shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's my Jesus. What does he do for a living? He's a shepherd. He's looking out over your lives. He's shepherding you. Let him. Final verse on that one. Turn to Psalm 23. Anytime we go into a nursing care facility and we read the shepherd's psalm, the people all know it. I'm not sure that our youth all know the shepherd's psalm, Psalm 23. But the generation before I sure knew it, Psalm 23. You could probably almost quote it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I like the way I got an email one time. A little kid was quoting it. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. What else could I want? <laughs> I thought that was good. But the Lord is, and this describes Jesus to a T. So just be ministered to as I read it. The King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's my Jesus. He leads me beside the still waters. Oh, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Jesus, what does he do for a living? He's a shepherd. 
Let him be your shepherd. Final point on that, I, I heard a wonderful story. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's, it bears repeating. That there was a great orator that got up and quoted the, the shepherd's psalm, you know, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he finished, And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the people thunderously applauded. But this man was full of pride, and he says, Who can do a better job than that? And a frail older preacher raised his hand. I can. Oh, yeah, sure, come up here. And the man got up and he began to read the shepherd's song. The Lord is my shepherd. What shall I, what else, you know, what shall I want? I, I, anyway, the point was he, he, he read it. And the people were stunned and stilled. And that was even a greater response than the thunderous applause. And the orator said, how did you do that? He said, son, I know the shepherd. I know the shepherd. That was the difference. What else does Jesus do for a living? Man, he's the creator. Turn to John chapter 1. Once again, another reference to John. Great gospel. When people first get saved, I believe John should be the first gospel that they read. It's so informational and inspirational. I want to read you a version which just touched my heart. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the New International Reader's Version. Al turned me on to that one. And then listen to what it says. Because we're talking about Jesus. What's he do for a living? He's the creator. In the beginning, the word was already there. The word was with God and the word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. Who are we talking about? Jesus, the creator. Jesus, the word. Verse 3, all things were made through him. Nothing that has been made was made without him. Man, look at the stars sometimes at night, especially getting out beyond the city lights, up in the UP, where they have milk. <laughs> and you'll see all these absolutely gorgeous stars and galaxies in the Milky Way. And you think, that Jesus, that in the beginning helped create all that, that Jesus lives in me. How can I possibly fail? Amen? All things were made through him, verse 3. Nothing that has been made was made without him. Life was in him. And that life was a light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. A man came who was sent from God. His name was John. He, gave, he came to give witness about that light. He gave witness so that all people could believe. John himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. The word was in the world that was made through him, but the world did not recognize him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. Some people did accept him. They believed in his name, and he gave them the right to become the children of God. To become a... To be a child of God has nothing to do with human parents. Children of God are not born because of human choice or because a husband wants them to be born. They are born because of what God does. And look at verse 14. I just love the way it reads in this translation. The Word became a human being. Boy, that speaks to me. He made His home with us. We've seen His glory. It's the glory of the one and only Son, he came from the Father, and he was full of grace and truth. What does Jesus do for a living? He's the creator. Last one. Last one. Turn to Matthew chapter 25, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 25. I'm sure there are other things that Jesus does for a living that I missed. But you know what? That's where you get to go ahead and study this beyond. On your own. And take these running starts that I give you and learn some more and dig some more and find some more out of God's excellent word. What else does Jesus do for a living? Jesus is a judge. Wait a minute. 
I thought Jesus didn't judge. Ah, well, he didn't judge while he was on the earth, but he himself said that the day is coming where he will sit in judgment. I think it was Martin Luther that said, I, there, there's, there's only two days on my calendar, today and that day. The day of judgment. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, who are we talking about? That's Jesus. Yeah, Jesus the Word, absolutely. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit upon the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And this is very important. Listen to it very carefully. Because this will help give you guidance for your life. And this will confirm for some of you the things that you're already doing or maybe not doing that you need to be doing. All the nations, verse 32, will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from the other as a shepherd. See, there's the shepherd again. Before him, he will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Boy, I want to be a sheep. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, see, there's another profession, he's a king. I'm not going to go into that today. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. And that can be physically, that can be spiritually. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. I have a certain older and wiser brother that uh, I respect very, very much because he takes the Bible and says, if it says it, I'll do it. And that's why Al has gotten involved with things like the Baldwin Center because of these words. That's why he wants to go to visit the jails because of these words. That's good motivation, isn't it? Good and godly things to do. Verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? <laughs> but the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did this unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And then they will also answer him and say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison? and not minister to you. And he will answer them in saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do these, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment with the righteous into eternal life. So Jesus is a judge. All these things he does for us. All these things he does to build up our spirit and our spiritual lives. Let's pray for a moment together. Father God, I've delivered my soul in giving the completeness of the teaching. But Lord God, I trust that your word is strong and goes into the hearts today of the people and those listening at home. And I pray in Jesus' name, I bind Satan's power. I break your power of blindness, Satan, in Jesus' name over the people hearing this message. I release them to see the light of the gospel. And Lord, here I am, send me, Lord of the harvest. And so folks, with your heads bowed just for another moment, it's so very important that you don't leave here without knowing that you're a child of the Most High God. And you can know. You can know it this morning.
The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. And if you confess Jesus is my Lord, then heaven becomes your destination. You become a very child of the Most High God. So pray this prayer in response as I pray. And mean it with your heart and heaven will become your home and God will become your very Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, everybody praying. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead for my salvation. And so I receive Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Cleanse me with your blood, Lord Jesus. Make me new. And I give you my whole life to follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody look up and smile. It's always a good thing to hear the gospel. It's always a good thing when the sermon's over. <laughs>